Is the Taliban secretly helping Al-Qaeda rise to power again? How will the regular citizens of Afghanistan fare under Taliban rule? And what does all this have to do with Israel and Palestine? As turmoil continues to engulf the Middle East, several powerful entities are hoping to turn this palpable tension to their advantage. Among these is none other than the Taliban, the Islamist extremist movement that seized control of Afghanistan in 2021. There is growing concern that the Taliban is weaponizing its support of fellow Sunni Islamist group Hamas in order to rebuild their influence and strengthen their allegiances with other extremist factions, including those considered to be terrorist groups. Let's take a look at the usual suspects. For many years, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda have maintained a close allegiance. Al-Qaeda, a pan-Islamist militant organization responsible for the terror attack at the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001, traces its roots back to Muslim resistance fighters rebelling against the Soviet Union during the Afghan War. At the time, the government of Afghanistan was becoming more progressive and had ideological ties that aligned with the Soviet Union. As newer policies were rolled out, many that improved the rights of Afghan citizens, particularly women, several ultra-conservative extremist groups formed militias and launched assaults against the communist government. These Mujahideen fighters received training and support from the Central Intelligence Agency, operating through neighboring Pakistan, with the U.S. effectively bolstering the resistance to indirectly push back against its ideological enemy, the Soviet Union. When these Soviets, who were allied with Afghanistan's government, withdrew from the country, these extremist factions used religious rhetoric to garner support from the Afghan people and continue to fight for control of the country. Of these groups, the two most prominent to emerge, given their use of brutal violence in pursuit of their goals, were the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. The U.S. military invaded Afghanistan in response to the September 11 terror attacks and would eventually withdraw from the country after two decades of fighting the Taliban and Al-Qaeda's forces. After the withdrawal, the Taliban seized control of the Afghan capital of Kabul, installing themselves as the ruling power over the country. In the time since achieving their goal of controlling Afghanistan, the Taliban have upheld their almost symbiotic relationship with what remains of Al-Qaeda. The extremist group has been laying low in recent years, but this isn't an indicator that they're gone for good. If anything, Al-Qaeda has been biding their time, intentionally staying under the radar. This might not mean that they're about to somehow return, but at present they're abiding by an arrangement made with the Taliban. In order to improve their international public-facing image, the Taliban are attempting to uphold a promise that they made to not allow extremist groups to use Afghanistan as a safe haven. But given their close ties, it seems likely Al-Qaeda could be still using parts of Afghanistan as exactly that, a place where they're able to regrow, regroup, and expand. There are those making the case that the Taliban have acknowledged their past mistakes and that it could be possible for the Western world to engage with them in a peaceful diplomatic manner. Now that the Taliban have secured control of Kabul, some have even asserted that the security of the country and the Afghan people is greater than it's been during the continuous conflict that's engulfed the region, dating even further back than the war in Afghanistan and the Afghan civil war before it. However, there is also a strong case to be made that the greatest threat to civilian life, especially during the more recent of those conflicts, was the Taliban themselves, given their penchant for tactics that directly endangered the lives of Afghan citizens, including the deployment of suicide bombers. Another reason that some of the countries might consider doing business with the Taliban now that they've seized power is the fact that they are also said to have halted the country's production of opium. This is a key ingredient in the drug heroin and is extracted from poppies that are native to Afghanistan. The Taliban has actively assigned a dedicated anti-narcotics unit to carry out patrols and eradicate poppy farming, which contributes to the production of opium. Some of those who were insurgent fighters for the Taliban during the war for control of the country are now trolling through fields of poppies and knocking the bulbs off with their sticks while their rifles are slung over their shoulders. This ban has apparently been imposed by the Taliban's supreme leader, Haibatullah Akunzada himself, citing the dangerous effects of opium created using poppy seed capsules and that the creation and use of heroin goes against the Taliban's extremist religion beliefs. More than 80% of the opium in the entire world used to come from Afghanistan, and heroin made using it as an ingredient accounted for 95% of the heroin market in Europe. However, tackling the production of one drug is a goal that becomes immediately undermined when it ends up being replaced with another illicit substance and one that can be just as harmful. While officially the Taliban has banned the production of opium and poppy farming, slowing down the heroin trade, the dealing of methamphetamines has only surged in Afghanistan and its surrounding countries. 
Since the ban on heroin, which has only lessened the amount being sold, mind you, not stopped it outright, the trafficking of methamphetamine has intensified, which indicates the drug is possibly being manufactured within the Taliban-controlled country. This is seemingly due to another plant that grows in abundance within the region, the ephedra plant. This contains ephedrines used in the production of methamphetamines, and having such easy access to the ephedra plant would make the drug easy and cheap to produce in larger quantities. However, Afghan methamphetamine traffickers require a lot of heavy labor and reliable harvests of the plant in order to produce the necessary ephedrines, although similar results can be achieved using common industrial-grade chemicals and medications for common colds. Thanks to this rapidly growing trade in the illicit substances, some of the methamphetamine has been seized as far away as Europe, Southeast Asia, and Eastern Africa, and is suspected to have originated from Afghanistan. While at the outset, the Taliban claimed to be dedicated to rebuilding Afghanistan, this brings with it abolishing anything that conflicts with their extremist views. That means, just like the laws of Afghanistan's Soviet-era communist government that they rejected, under the Taliban, the human rights of women are under threat. Millions of school-age girls are banned from receiving education under the Taliban's regime, and even higher education, such as universities, are not permitted to accept enrollment from female students. Women who had previously been breadwinners and heads of their families have had their right to work taken away entirely, as well as their access to healthcare facilities being limited. Then there's what's been considered a likely possibility that the Taliban are harboring terrorists from Al-Qaeda, despite the line of thinking that the extremist group is unlikely to reconstitute itself within Afghanistan. There's still the danger that they could see a resurgence, especially since these Al-Qaeda members share some extremist views with the now ruling force of the country that's allegedly harboring them. In the past, Al-Qaeda's organization was exclusive and tight-knit with its membership restricted in order to keep anyone out that wasn't considered pure under their extreme doctrine. Now that the Taliban have seized control over Afghanistan, that's brought with it the concern that Al-Qaeda will aim to move beyond its own previously more restrictive rules and become politically integrated with the Taliban. A more direct collaboration between these two groups with aligned goals could see the Taliban using their newly instated power to legitimize Al-Qaeda. During the War on Terror, several factors limited the effectiveness of the extremist group as they hid out in areas of Pakistan. A number of former Al-Qaeda leaders were killed in counterterrorism operations carried out by the United States, leading the organizational structure of the group to suffer as a result. This combined with competing ideologies with other extremist groups like ISIS, the so-called Islamic State. The differences between these factions created rivalries, with each competing for control over the global narrative of the jihadist movement. So this could push Al-Qaeda to shift toward becoming incorporated with the Taliban, a potential strategy that can be traced back to Al-Qaeda's recent leader, Egyptian doctor Eman al-Zawahiri. Al-Zawahiri took over as the leader of Al-Qaeda following the death of Osama bin Laden in 2011 and initially linked the group's ideology with their tactics. To him, Al-Qaeda was intended to be a more violent movement, and he had to be in order to overthrow the governments of the Middle East that they felt conflicted with their Islamic extremist views. However, over time, the group's continued survival became a more pressing goal for al-Zawahiri, and this led to him revising their ideology if they were to continue to exist and not split off into smaller and less effective splinter groups. In September 2013, al-Zawahiri created the general guidelines for the work of jihad in which he emphasized the importance of self-discipline in carrying out al-Qaeda's intended long-term goal. He highlighted that they would need safe bases from which to operate, and that while the West was their ultimate target, their focus should first be on fighting local governments and regimes within the Middle East. It was al-Zawahiri's belief that a sophisticated localized strategy would better prepare al-Qaeda for their end objective, and in order to achieve that, they would need a guaranteed space from which they could conduct their operations and grow. So in other words, their leader recognized that to get what they wanted, al-Qaeda needed allies that they could depend on for protection. And 10 years later, their old pals, the Taliban, would seize control of Afghanistan. Acting together would avoid the risks of the same ideological clashes that had previously kept Al-Qaeda working with other extremist groups, and would protect Al-Qaeda from future counterterrorism operations if they were legitimized under the Taliban, whose power over Afghanistan came as the result of an agreement with the United States, leading to the withdrawal of American troops and the Taliban's subsequent takeover of Kabul. The evacuation of U.S. forces and a number of Afghan officials opposed to the Taliban and their ideology opened up the opportunity for al-Qaeda to meet the goal that their deceased leader set out. He thought that if the group was going to work directly with ideologically aligned allies, then this would enable them to survive potential future wars against the U.S. and its allies, which in theory would bleed the Western world of its financial resources 
and gradually undermine its global influence. In other words, a war of attrition. A number of senior Al-Qaeda leaders are thought to be located in various areas of Afghanistan, including Kabul, Kunar, Kandahar, and Helmand, and as many as 400 foot soldiers. That number climbs to 2,000 if you count relatives and sympathizers and if reporting by the UN is to be believed. This network of extremists is thought to be operating out of the central, southern, and eastern regions of Afghanistan, limiting their communications with each other in order to maintain a low profile and avoid detection by international counterterrorism agencies. These remnants of Al-Qaeda are also thought to have established safe houses in Kabul, Helmand, Farah, and Herat, as well as new training camps in Helmand, Zabul, and Nangar. The easternmost provinces of Afghanistan are also thought to be home to Al-Qaeda camps, including one specifically designed to train suicide bombers. A number of terrorist fighters from other areas of the Middle East as well as North Africa are believed to have arrived in these areas to bolster the ranks of these extremist fighters. While in this phase of restructuring their organization, with their main goal being the establishment of new bases to operate from, their other objectives are recruiting in order to expand their forces and reaching out to allies and affiliated groups. As well as the Taliban in Afghanistan, there's a contingent of Al-Qaeda supporting the primary group from the Indian subcontinent, predominantly consisting of extremists from neighboring Pakistan. Just as al-Zawahiri intended, the continued furthering of Al-Qaeda's infrastructure and mobilization of their personnel within Afghanistan is allowing them better security and connectivity with other groups that share their ideology. With al-Zawahiri dead, the current leaders of Al-Qaeda have stationed themselves near the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, enabling them to move back and forth between countries unhindered so they can take a direct role in the operation of the Afghanistan and Pakistan-based factions of Al-Qaeda. Additionally, the aforementioned camps are thought to be largely situated on the southwestern borders that connect Afghanistan with Pakistan and Iran, providing the extremist organization more protection from international counterterrorism operations that would seek to dismantle their efforts to rebuild. This location would also better provide Al-Qaeda with the means to escape into the wider Middle East if their status within Afghanistan was compromised. At present, they appear to be safe to continue operating there thanks to the protection provided by the Taliban and their regime. Adopting a more bureaucratic method of operating has allowed Al-Qaeda to work in conjunction with the Taliban more seamlessly. Some of Al-Qaeda's members have been granted jobs within the public administration and law enforcement sectors of the Taliban's regime. With the support of the Haqqani Network, an Afghan Islamist group that fought against both the Soviets in the 80s and the NATO coalition forces led by the US during the war in Afghanistan. The Haqqani Network is responsible for the deaths of thousands of innocent Afghan citizens, as well as hundreds of coalition soldiers. As a demonstration of loyalty to the current ruling regime of Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda members are now employed by the Taliban in law enforcement and have been using their newfound positions to protect high-ranking members of the Taliban establishing fealty between the two groups and allowing them to grow increasingly codependent. One example of this involved a senior Taliban commander and member of the Haqqani network, Tajmir Jawad. He's also the former leader of the Kabul network, another group that consisted largely of operatives from both the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, and together they coordinated suicide attacks against NATO coalition forces. Now Jawad, one of the key figures involved in these attacks against US-led troops, has been made the deputy director of the Taliban General Directorate of Intelligence, allowing him to oversee and supervise Al-Qaeda's activity within Afghanistan, as well as facilitating the entrance of foreign terrorist fighters into the country. Other governors appointed to the regions of Kapisa and Nuristan, named Kari Asanullah Baryal and Hafiz Muhammad Aga Hakim, respectively, are also known to have pre-existing ties to Al-Qaeda. Baryal is believed to have once been a senior leader within the aforementioned Kabul network, working alongside Taj Mir Jawad. Meanwhile, Hakim holds close ties to Kari Zakir, a prominent figure in the Haqqani network who is responsible for coordinating their suicide operations. Zakir is also thought to have involvement with the Taliban Special Forces Unit, also known as Badri 313 Battalion, who were also created with the help of Al-Qaeda fighters. In short, there's a distinctive web of people connected with Al-Qaeda within the Taliban regime, which could lend itself to the extremist movement finding legitimacy and enough footing to rebuild with the Taliban's continued support. Reportedly, the symbiosis between Taliban and Al-Qaeda has already extended beyond just appointing the Al-Qaeda members to roles within the Taliban regime. Monthly welfare payments are believed to be received from the Taliban by Al-Qaeda members, which have the potential to financially bolster the movement and their affiliates like AQIS, the Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. The level at which both the Taliban and Al-Qaeda have become interwoven even means that there are training manuals from the latter group 
being used at the facilities of the Taliban's Ministry of Defense, whose training director is also a member of Al-Qaeda. Identity documentation has reportedly been created and disseminated to Al-Qaeda members thanks to the Taliban's head of the Ministry of the Interior, Sirajuddin Haqqani, who seems to also hold close ties to the Al-Qaeda extremists present within Afghanistan. Yet, meanwhile, the official stance by the Taliban's supreme leader, Habatullah Akhundzada, is that Al-Qaeda should continue to be prosecuted. However, given the probable cooperation between both and Al-Qaeda's intention to ally themselves with the Taliban, it seems likely that this has only been made the official policy on the face of it as a way for the supreme leader to appease the West and allow the Taliban to continue operating alongside Al-Qaeda with impunity. Back during the aftermath of the Afghan war, the Soviets were able to drive much of the early Taliban out of the country toward neighboring Pakistan. However, it was there that the scattered Mujahideen fighters were galvanized into an organized effort under the guidance of figureheads like Muhammad Omar, the militant leader of the Taliban who would later briefly become Emir of Afghanistan when the group was able to take Kabul before being driven back out by US-led NATO forces. During his brief stint as the Emir, Omar had previously refused to extradite Osama bin Laden, who was believed to have been hiding in Afghanistan at the time. And it was this refusal to turn over bin Laden that prompted the US invasion. In much the same vein, Al-Qaeda had its fair share of figureheads that drove their organization toward their extreme goals, such as the aforementioned bin Laden and al-Zawahiri before their deaths. Under their leadership, Al-Qaeda also successfully assisted the Taliban and the Haqqani network in establishing a strong resistance base within Pakistan, allowing them to fight directly against the US and their allies. And this ultimately led to a resurgence of the Taliban within Pakistan. Al-Zawahiri also formally collaborated with the Haqqani network, assisting them in consolidating their power in Afghanistan over the Taliban themselves. With all this intermingling and collaboration between the members of these different factions, it calls into question just how much distinction there is between the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and the various other Islamic extremist entities. While they're all different organizations with nuanced differences in some of their extreme beliefs, the connections between them, through the likes of the Haqqani network, create bridges between these groups that enable them to fight alongside each other against the West. Further links between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda have been solidified through various marriages and kinship ties, as well as both groups shared history of fighting alongside each other on the front lines against the armies of the United States and other NATO countries. The ties between both were so close during the war in Afghanistan that when he was killed by a drone strike in July of 2022, Al-Zawahiri was found to be living in a palatial villa in Kabul that was owned by figures associated with the Haqqani network. He's unlikely to have been the only Al-Qaeda member being housed that close to the capital. And now that the Taliban are calling the shots in Kabul, if they were to open their embassies to Western diplomats, these visitors to Afghanistan could be at risk of the actions of Al-Qaeda extremists that the Taliban have allowed to reside in their capital. But that was the deliberate strategy and lasting legacy of Al-Zawahiri, ensuring that these understated relationships between his organization and the Taliban remained as strong as they were secretive. Through continued strategic patience, Al-Qaeda has been able to entrench itself within the Taliban's regime, spreading into their governing bodies and societal sectors as a way to firmly put down their roots in Afghanistan. This allows Al-Qaeda to not only remain a clandestine army within a country, but has made them a key part of the infrastructure controlling it, meaning that they have the support of the Taliban to operate freely, safely, and without concern that their activity might be exposed. Al-Qaeda still holds the fundamental belief that they are the self-appointed forerunners of the jihadist movement and that their actions will eliminate governments and leaders throughout the Middle East that do not align with their extremist views, as well as those within North Africa. Under the Taliban's rule of Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda is able to continue rebuilding and training a new generation of extremist fighters from the ranks of foreign terrorist fighters joining their cause. Every president of the United States since 9-11 has considered Al-Qaeda to be defeated, Yet every time this has been premature, the level to which a full-scale resurgence of Al-Qaeda is likely is uncertain, as there are certainly those who believe that their alleged infiltration of the Taliban's administration poses a legitimate threat, both locally and internationally. But as they carefully train new recruits and network, spreading their allegiances to other affiliates, all with the protection and financial support of the Taliban, the question remains, what about the Taliban themselves? What more are they doing to rebuild? Well, for starters, the Taliban still have their work cut out for them in terms of restoring the infrastructure of Afghanistan after the withdrawal of NATO coalition troops. For one, running a country requires having strong financial and trade agreements with other nations. In the interest of rebuilding, 
the Taliban have said they plan to maintain diplomatic relations with China and will potentially rely on them for economic support in the wake of the US withdrawal and subsequent Taliban takeover of Kabul. Hoping to prevent an economic collapse within the country, the Taliban spokesperson, Zabihullah Mujahid, said that Beijing would be the main partner of the extremist regime. You might be wondering how this is even possible and how another country can conduct diplomatic relations with the Taliban given that they were formerly extremist insurgents. Their pledges to be more moderate and uphold some human rights are partly responsible for the Taliban receiving support from countries like China, as well as promises that under the new regime, the Taliban doesn't intend to seek retribution or reprise engaging in violence with its former enemies. The United States, as well as any number of its allies, have ceased diplomatic missions to Afghanistan and will only recognize the Taliban's government as legitimate depending on the group's actions. In other words, they're becoming cautious and playing a wait-and-see game, as any potential future economic aid, such as that which supported the previous Afghan government, is conditional to the Taliban's conduct and whether or not they uphold human rights as they have promised to. Given how the treatment of women has worsened under the Taliban's regime, it seems unlikely that these pledges to do so are to be delivered on. Humanitarian organizations have warned, without external aid, the people of Afghanistan are likely to suffer. A vast number of civilians unaffiliated with the Taliban or other extremists have been forced to flee their homes in droves of hundreds of thousands. Add to the mix of severe drought in the area and the US government freezing Afghanistan's central bank reserves, leading to a financial crisis in the country, and a widespread humanitarian catastrophe seems worryingly possible. This is where China comes in. Given their status as one of the largest economies in the world, it seems like a good diplomatic relation between them and Afghanistan would be worthwhile for the Taliban and would likely help with their current economic issues. China is also unlikely to have aid to Afghanistan conditional over infringements of human rights, given that their government has also been accused numerous times of violating basic human rights. The Taliban's treatment of Afghan citizens is unlikely to factor into China's decision to support them financially with China instead looking to the potential economic, political, and security benefits of aiding Afghanistan and thus the Taliban's regime. For the Taliban, investment from China would offer them more opportunities to rebuild. They've expressed interest in China's current plan to develop infrastructure and development by tightening economic and political ties with other countries. Afghanistan's also home to mines rich with copper, which can be modernized with investments from China. And this could provide Afghanistan with a valuable commodity to trade in global markets. China has also vowed to keep its embassy in Afghanistan open to ease strengthening of relations and provide humanitarian aid. Where other diplomats and ambassadors from other countries were forced to leave when Taliban took control of Kabul, China is looking to assist Afghanistan, particularly in helping provide treatment for COVID-19. These strengthening international ties could not only help support the Taliban's rebuilding of Afghanistan, but would also undermine the strategy by the United States and other Western countries to use economic leverage to pressure the Taliban to uphold their pledges for maintaining the human rights of Afghan citizens. It's worth remembering that the formation of the Taliban can be traced back to US interference in Afghanistan back in the 80s. And despite trying to use economics to further determine the country's future instead of the CIA, the Taliban are finding ways around this disruptive interference from the US. Additionally, Russia has also continued diplomatic relations with Afghanistan. But time will tell if foreign investments are able to prop up the Taliban's plans to rebuild, as they are currently working with the international funds that supported the previous Afghan government, which could very quickly dry up and lead to an economic collapse of the entire country. But anyone invested in the complicated and interconnected web of Middle Eastern politics is surely thinking at this point, how does the conflict between Israel and Palestine factor into the Taliban and their attempts to rebuild Afghanistan? Well, it largely comes down to how they and other extremist groups like them, including Al-Qaeda, have worked to muddy the waters of that conflict even further. A range of Islamic extremists and known terrorist groups of the same ideology have vocalized their support of the Islamic resistance movement, a Sunni Islamist political and military organization that governed the Gaza Strip, also known by the acronym of their Arabic name, Hamas. Following the attack carried out by Hamas on October 7, 2023, Israel retaliated by assaulting Gaza, with a considerable number of innocent Palestinian civilians caught in the crossfire and tragically losing their lives as a result. The debate over the situation has been widespread, with those calling for a ceasefire and peaceful resolution clashing with those supporting Israel's right to defend itself against the Hamas attack, and during this further adding to the division caused by this ongoing, 
nuanced discourse, a number of statements from other Islamic extremists have been issued from Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and the Islamic State in support of Hamas and condemning Israel's actions. Now, as we mentioned earlier, this muddies the waters in a rather insidious way, given how much of the nuance surrounding the Israel and Palestinian conflict is already being overlooked by reactionaries. The support for Hamas by the Taliban and Al-Qaeda can be misinterpreted, possibly even deliberately by bad faith actors, as support from these groups for all of Palestine. It has never been more important to remember that the Palestinian people are not Hamas. Hamas is one extremist group that exists within the country. Support of Hamas by fellow extremists does not mean that showing sympathy toward ordinary Palestinians should be condemned or treated as a support of extremism. Across the responses to the October 7 attack, there was the resounding support from the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and fellow extremist groups that framed the condemnable actions of Hamas as a legitimate reaction against Israel and their long history of abuse against the people of Palestine. Many of the responses from the international extremist community drew parallels between the actions of Hamas and their own actions. However, there was also divergences between the responses, most notably some that congratulated Hamas and some that instead focused on the Palestinian people. This is primarily because of the mixed feelings toward Hamas that exist among some extremist groups. Given that Hamas is a nationalistic Islamist group, and certain other Islamic extremists view nationalism as a malevolent creation of Western countries. In their response to October 7, the Taliban declared their solidarity with Palestinians, but not with Hamas itself. There were for a time some far-fetched allegations that the Taliban's regime was considering providing military support to Hamas in order to fight Israel, but these claims originated from falsified information within a post on Twitter spreading misinformation that the Taliban intended to join the fighting. This post was viewed two and a half million times and was also cited by several news outlets despite not being true. The Taliban have since condemned the ongoing genocide in Palestine, stating that Israel's actions amounts to war crimes and crimes against humanity. While some might rightly call this hypocritical coming from the Taliban, it also aligns with the stance of numerous prominent human rights organizations as well. Needless to say, we're living in turbulent times, and even that is an understatement. For the Taliban, their focus is squarely on rebuilding and restoring what they can of Afghanistan, potentially through diplomatic and economic agreements with nations like China and Russia. Meanwhile, there may still remain a considerable presence of Al-Qaeda members within the Taliban's regime. While that group focuses on rebuilding through strengthening its allegiances with the new ruling power in Kabul, as well as other extremists. One thing is for certain though, the eyes of the global intelligence community will be firmly fixed on the happenings in Afghanistan for quite some time.